All right, welcome back. And this, this presentation is mine. It's got, it has a rather grand title, The 20th Century on the Radio, so you may be here for a while. But seriously, folks. Um, actually, I started with a rather grand title and had a, a mishap with uh, uh, slides and a drive uh, last night that lasted into the morning. So I've, I've basically rescued the World War II portion of this and was able to expand it somewhat. But I hope I make my broader points about uh, uh, the, the resource and the, the, the use and the value of, of radio in, in history uh, in, uh, and in our collections. So we have something like four million recordings of all sorts in the Library of Congress's sound holdings, and a huge portion of that is radio broadcasts. Uh, a huge portion of those radio broadcasts are from NBC. We did acquire the NBC collection in the late 1970s, and um, it has, I think, more or less ever since then been our number one uh, re most requested resource in the uh, uh, Recorded Sound Reference Center. And that's across the board for comedy, drama, soap operas, uh, and, and news. And uh, unfortunately, what's come down, what comes down to us on uh, modern day radio are, are just the, the sound bites of history. The things that you all kind of know anyway. So you, on you know, every December 7th, you can count on hearing the break-in announcement uh, of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And you can, whenever President Roosevelt is discussed, you can count on perhaps hearing the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, and, and so on. And um, uh, it's great that we have those recordings, but what is not better known is that we have many, many, many other recordings pertaining to uh, those eras and others. And so in this uh, portion, which is mainly on World War II, I just want to show um, you know, the depth of things, uh, how it plays out in different kinds of radio, and how it uh, played, was playing out well before World War II really began. So the earliest, uh, actually, let's get these out of order, uh, December 24th, 1937. Well, that's the time in New York. It was actually Christmas Day in Shanghai. And I think NBC, the networks like to do these worldwide things, you know, calling in uh, Christmas greetings from around the world. And there being a detachment of Marines in the Shanghai uh, International Settlement, uh, <clears throat> they had arranged to do this. And there was even a detachment of the Marine Band to play Christmas carols and so on. However, uh, events overtook them. And um, by Christmas Day of 37, the international settlement was surrounded by the Japanese army. And this was a standoff, a show of force, uh, but it was a very tense situation. Uh, and they went ahead with the broadcast, I suppose to their credit, uh, but it's a very unusual broadcast. I hope you can hear it well enough. It was done by shortwave um, from halfway around the world. Uh, and it's only about 15 minutes. I'm only gonna play you a couple of minutes. It starts off with the, uh, you know, the chaplain making very general statements about uh, how wonderful Christmas is and how proud they all are to be uh, serving there. Uh, and then there are messages from officers and enlisted men. And in this, you're going to, at the end of this, you're going to hear a member of the United Press International, uh, who's obviously under the strictest censorship and is not too thrilled at going through with the broadcast, but he did it. So uh, I hope you can hear this well enough. Since I am going to die, I'll have the one small satisfaction of... No, that's not it. There, I only do this manually. This is LWO number... Big Fleet, I wish you all a very Merry Christmas. And we have with us a man who for until the Marines uh, outfit out here became a brigade, commanded the 4th Battalion, the United States Marine Corps, Colonel Price. Good morning, America. I hope that you will never have the kind of equipment that the Chinese are experiencing this year. Look to your national defense. It works 
protect you from the sort of tragedy which we are witnessing in Shanghai today. Could you make that out? And now we have Sorry. with us a few of the guests who like to uh, say hello in a little more personal way. We'll start out with uh, John Warren from the United Press. Good morning. Out of deference to Chaplain Hamilton's complaint about alarming news reports, I've been instructed to confine my remarks to greeting my mother and daughter in Washington. I hope you're listening. So the uh, the first the officer said, "I hope that uh, you all never have a Christmas like the Chinese are having this year." And then that was the UPI reporter saying, basically saying he'd been limited to saying "Hi, Mom," uh, which he which he did. And <laughs> uh, and the program continues in that rather uncomfortable vein, you know, for the remainder of the 15 minutes. Uh, so got my things a little bit out of order here. Um, Dorothy Thompson, uh, foreign correspondent, writer, commentator, not very well remembered today, though there uh, is a, yes? Oh, okay, first of all, it was a shortwave broadcast, so the, what you're gonna hear in a moment, Dorothy Thompson is a studio recording, much, much better. So it was a shortwave broadcast, and that was the, you know, what uh, was captured on a 16-inch lacquer disc at NBC Studios in New York. Um, which by that time was a very good system and you could make very good recordings on it. I mean, the NBC Symphony was recorded on those discs, but it's a signal coming in from thousands of miles away. So, so Dorothy Thompson, um, <clears throat> this broadcast is from September 1st and it's from about the middle of uh, two, three weeks of daily broadcast that she did for NBC. As the situation deteriorated in Europe in August of 1939 and the Stalin-Hitler Pact was announced, they brought her on because she was one of the most experienced American journalists when it came to European affairs. She'd lived in Germany. She'd met and interviewed Hitler years before. She knew quite well you know, what was going on, not just politically, but the, the personal dynamics of the individuals involved. So we're going to hear, this is what uh, she broadcast. I believe this is the afternoon of September 1st, 1939. The National Broadcasting Company brings you another in a series of general discussions by that noted woman commentator and former foreign correspondent, Dorothy Thompson. Miss Thompson. The last thing I heard on the radio when I went to bed last night was an announcement that Adolf Hitler had locked himself in his room to meditate on a great decision. The first thing I heard at dawn this morning was a voice. It was a voice that I first heard 10 years ago and have often heard since. The tone of defiance, of self-pity, of self-congratulation is one with which the world is now familiar. And as I heard it, I knew that the curtain had gone up on the final act of the tragedy of Germany and that the last act of the tragedy of Germany is the tragedy of Europe. The speech that Adolf Hitler made before the Reichstag began with an announcer saying, on this fateful day for the German people, we transmit this speech of the Führer over the radio networks of the world. And then they called in all languages, and the announcer went on. We have hurried here from all ends of the Reich by airplane, summoned at three in the morning to await the decision that Adolf Hitler has made. That Adolf Hitler has made, one man made, one man decided to take his nation to war against a vast part of the whole world, against the British Commonwealth of Nations scattered throughout the earth, against the Republic of France and her possessions on two continents. So that's September 1st, 1939, and uh, it's, of course, it's more than two years before the United States is involved, but it's very much on people's minds and not just a topic of the news. Now, this period from the uh, from late September, um, late September through the fall and winter of 1939 into 1940 is sometimes called the phony war, because there was uh, even though you know Poland had fallen um, and. Uh, 
you know, if France, England were officially at war uh, with uh, Germany, uh, but there seemed not to be so much happening, at least perhaps in, in the United States. However, um, obviously it's on people's minds, and it was very much on the mind of Arch Obler, who was one of the most popular writers of um, suspense and mystery and horror programs. And uh, he had a series called Arch Obler's Plays, and he did one simply called Bathysphere from November 18th, 1939. And uh, like a lot of Obler's work, it's a, a almost absurd uh, situation, but uh, so appropriate to the times that it's quite effective. Uh, the Bathysphere, of course, was a real thing, a diving bell um, in which William Beebe and Otis Barton uh, set deep sea diving records a few years before. In this play, uh, we have an anonymous inventor who is taking the uh, unnamed dictator of an unnamed country down in the diving bell to break the new world record so the dictator can pin some more medals on himself. Um, well, when they get down there and break the, uh, uh, the, the, the record, he has a surprise in store for him. He says he's cut the cable and they're gonna die down there. And this is the response of the dictator. The dictator is played by George Zuko, uh, who's uh, probably best known for playing the pharaoh in uh, the Ten Commandments, but uh, made a specialty of horror movies. And uh, Hans Conried, um, usually heard in a more comic role. So uh, here we are, Bathysphere, November 18th, 1939. I'll point out that although this is the period of the so-called phony war, about 10 days after this broadcast, Soviet Union invades Finland, and that wasn't phony at all. Since I am going to die, I'll have the one small satisfaction of showing you that you're an empty-headed fool. Stop saying that! Ah, you too have an ego. Apparently it's lived for weeks on how you'd make me plead and beg and squirm down on my knees. I had a few moments of hysteria, didn't I? You like that. But you don't like this. My sitting in the dark so calmly telling you that you're a fool? I haven't failed. You're here. You failed because if you're killing me and yourself to give them back their freedom, whatever that word means, you're dying quite in vain. You're saying that because you think... No, don't talk. Listen to me. I'll tell you where you failed. I came into power not alone through my own strength, but because the conditions of our country were such that other men sitting on their wealth came to the decision that I alone could keep them there. But it was you... I tell you, listen. When an ancient rule of privilege is threatened, it seeks to live no matter what the cost. The cost of them was me, and they found me worth it. For I threw to the mass none of the wealth they'd worked to build, but only fighting phrases of prejudice and hate that cost the men who made me nothing but the rent of the halls for the simple to hear my opiates. And so I call you fool. Fool to die and fool to kill me. For well, the conditions that made me will still exist when I'm dead. You free them of me. But what of hunger? What of ruthless exploitation? These will still be free up there to put hate and desperation into men. And so the ones who gave me power will find a new leader to stop the rumblings of rebellion with all the tricks that I taught them. A new leader. You hear me, fool, a new leader. No, it isn't true. It can't be true. It's so dark. If I could see your face to see the fool discovering he's a fool. They will be free. They will, they will. What magic do you think will come into the air when I'm dead? So, again, a classic Arch Obler situation. Uh, two men arguing about uh, democracy and fascism at the bottom of the ocean inside a tiny steel ball under, uh, with oxygen running out under you know, countless tons of pressure. Uh, but that was the world in 1939. Since I am. Now, skip ahead a couple of years, but the United States is still not in the war. But uh, we're getting programs like this. Speaking of Liberty, hosted by Rex Stout, the mystery writer, who was something of a public intellectual. And um, he had this uh, show in 1941, and he would have on people like Edmund Taylor, a well-known writer at the time, who had made an analysis of uh, Nazi and fascist propaganda. And uh, as you'll hear, this show is tightly scripted. Uh, and uh, Stout is playing the, the stooge, 
to uh, Taylor here, but it's uh, it's interesting bit of radio and an interesting you know bit of history. Um, April twenty fourth, nineteen forty one. Mr. Taylor has made a special study of the devices used by the Germans in the present war, so we are asking him tonight to discuss them. Mr. Taylor, will you tell us something of the propaganda you've seen in operation overseas? Gladly, Mr. Stout, but first, if I may make a personal remark, I'd like to mention something that I meant to tell you before we went on the air. Your face is dirty. My what? You're crazy. I washed my hands and face less than an hour ago. Oh, your hands are all right, but your face is very dirty. I don't believe it. I looked in the mirror in the washroom. Maybe you did, but I'm looking straight at you now, and frankly, you're a sight. You must have been eating mud pies. Dirty is putting it mildly. Well, for Mr. Cross, is there a mirror around here anywhere? I don't know, but I'll try to find one. Anybody got a mirror? Don't bother, Mr. Cross. Propaganda, Stout. What do you mean, propaganda? I mean, that was it, and it worked. You notice I didn't say your hands were dirty or that you had lost a button from your coat. One glance would have shown you that I was lying, but you can't glance at your face. You knew very well your face wasn't dirty, but in ten seconds I had you yelling for a mirror. In the same way, defeatists in this country, for instance, inject the poison of doubt into us. They aren't stupid enough to try to persuade Americans that they are cowards and quitters or that their navy is no good. More shrewdly, they did it into us day after day that the Nazis are too hot to handle and that the British are already licked. That is no more true than my statement that your face was dirty, but you began yelling for a mirror. After this, I'll carry my own mirror. But are you saying that all propaganda is merely a pack of lies? By no means. For instance, if your face really had been dirty, I would have said, Mr. Stout, you're black in the face. You must have the bubonic plague or something. You would have looked in the mirror and then called for a thermometer. That's just how the Nazis work. They announce victories in the Balkans, which are true, then they say this proves that the democracies were doomed before they started to fight, that the trend is against them. In the same way, Hitler's armies stamp out democracy in Europe, and Nazi propaganda says, you see, Europe has discarded democracy and gone fascist. They can't stamp out our democracy by force, so they try to talk us out of it. One day they tell us democracy is inefficient, that we do nothing but argue and have no discipline. The next day they say the trouble with us is, we are not a real democracy, just a Pluto-democracy. A dictatorship of plutocrats, which oppresses the masses and has no respect for human rights. All right, skipping ahead to Christmas Eve, 1941. By now, of course, uh, the United States is uh, fully into World War II. This was uh, and still an annual, annual event. I think they do it earlier in December now, but for many years it was done on Christmas Eve, the president lighting the White House Christmas tree. Uh, we won't hear him, but uh, for this broadcast, he was joined by Winston Churchill, who was visiting to address Congress. And this is, um, <clears throat> you'll hear a bit of Roosevelt, but you're gonna hear more of Buck Connell providing the Spanish uh, translation in, in shortwave simulcast. And this is a broadcast of NBC's International Division which was a uh, shortwave operation broadcasting in several languages, including French, Spanish, Italian, German, um, uh, Spanish and Portuguese uh, to uh, Central and South America, uh, where they were widely heard. And they could also be picked up uh, in, in the US. And uh, having a shortwave radio was not so unusual in those days. You, you could get one. It was not, did not cost you that much more than a, uh, uh, a good regular AM radio. Uh, so, you know, just to uh, uh, give a bit of the flavor and just a reminder of how international this war was. Ahora, el presidente de los Estados Unidos, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Fellow workers for freedom. There are many men and women in America, sincere and faithful men and women, Obreros de la libertad. Hay muchos hombres y mujeres en este mundo, hombres y mujeres sinceros y fieles, que en estas Navidades se preguntan cómo podemos encender nuestros árboles, cómo podemos hacer nuestros regalos, cómo podemos reunirnos para adorar a Dios con amor y con corazones levantados dentro de un mundo en guerra, un mundo de lucha, de sufrimiento y de muerte. 
¿Cómo podemos olvidarnos del mundo como se han olvidado los hombres y mujeres en años de paz para regocijarnos en el natalicio de Cristo? Estas son preguntas naturales, inevitables. Now, this next broadcast is um, part of the OWI, our Office of War Information Collection, which is an enormous collection, even though uh, the OWI only existed for about three and a half years. Um, and uh, this would have been heard not really in the United States, but by uh, American troops overseas. Uh, OWI broadcast in pretty much, or by, by, by a short wave that is, in most of the languages spoken in the various theaters of uh, World War II. And it, 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 for um, American and English soldiers, it provided entertainment, but also news. And um, the, of course, the American armed forces were segregated in those days, but here's an interesting exception that really ought to be better known. Um, Hugh Mulzac, Captain Hugh Mulzac, was a uh, uh, West Indian immigrant who uh, captained an integrated ship for the Merchant Marine during the war, one of four or five uh, such ships. His was the first, and it was at his insistence that he had an integrated crew, which he'll describe briefly here in this 1943 broadcast. I've sailed the seas for 35 years, and I've been in more ports than I can count. And I've met people of all races, color, and creed. I know that people all over the world look to America as a hope of democracy and victory. We Americans do not want to fail. We cannot and will not. Today, while the battle for freedom is carried to every ocean and every fight in front, my country has had enough faith in me to entrust the lives of others in my hands. I'm the captain of a ship with a mixed crew of white men and Negroes from 18 different nations. And Edward R. Murrow is best known for his work in the 1950s opposing Senator McCarthy. Um, one sound clip you tend to, you hear a lot of him is just him intoning, this is London. And it seems very little else, even though people do acknowledge uh, his great work during the war. Um, but the, he made a, a, a lengthy uh, broadcast uh, late in the day, uh, close to midnight in, in the States uh, on VE Day from London. Uh, we'll hear just a, a portion of it, but it's really one of the, most, the best broadcasts he did. London is a curious town. Nothing seems to surprise it, not even buzz bombs. There are little streets where you may meet anyone. And tonight it's easy to imagine that old friends are walking there. Some of the boys you watch jump at Namagan. Flyers you watch go down in flames over Berlin or a dozen other targets. And you wonder what's happened to the American boys who used to stand on those street corners, far from home and rather lonesome. The soldiers who waited and trained for D-Day and who have since demonstrated that they were not living on the reputations made by their grandfathers. The price of victory has been high. We don't yet know just how high, how many twisted minds and bodies, how much loss of faith and hope. The first task is to bury the dead and feed the living. The formal declaration of victory will not return the wandering millions to their homes or provide food for the hungry, or clothes for the ill-clad. Edward R. Morrow. Now that um, is another shortwave broadcast that would have been picked up in New York, but as you can hear, it's a much stronger signal, shorter distance, uh, and eight years later, so the technology had improved somewhat, and, and it's a lot easier to follow. And I'm... Uh, Close out with something that has nothing to do with World War II, um, but is a good example of um, uh, returning to Rex Stout, uh, his career as a, again, as a public intellectual, but also by the 1950s, uh, the networks had a bit more faith in um, uh, air personalities, not to say bad things 
on the air. So it's a much uh, more spontaneous and uh, much more relaxed presentation. Uh, so here is uh, Stout with host Clifton Fadiman and uh, Jacques Barzan, another uh, uh, public intellectual, and they're talking about mysteries. In the 19th century, that form of, of pursuing a criminal. Okay, now, are you saying, Mr. Barzan, that the detective story rejuvenates itself by means of blood transfusion from uh, other kinds of novels, the humorous novel, the satirical novel, the psychological novel, and so forth? Yes, and with each transfusion, it, it becomes less and, and, and less away. itself. Yeah. Well, well, even so, you see, I completely disagree with what Mr. Barzan just said, that the interesting thing in the detective story was it's, uh, it's developing the point of, of creating, of having an inquiry, of having a puzzle, and of getting it answered ingeniously. Is, isn't that more or less it? You see, I just don't think that's true. Oh. What, what, what are by far the most popular and famous detective stories ever written? They're, per, they're pretty bum stories, the Sherlock Holmes stories. But it's the people you remember. They, they aren't very good stories. But, but what, what Conan Doyle did was to make Sherlock Holmes live. He, a, actually, if you want to, for amusement or for any other reason, if you want to take those 60 Sherlock Holmes stories and analyze them as stories, as plots, at least two-thirds of them are pretty doggone silly. And uh, several of them are so preposterous that no, no detective story writer writing today, even if he can't write one-tenth as well as Doyle, and even if he can't create a character one one-thousandth as interesting as Sherlock Holmes, wouldn't dream of using such a shoddy plot. Oh, all that is, is heresy to me, because although I'm uh, fully as much an admirer of, of Holmes and Watson as character... Okay. So that's what I have. I'm sorry I didn't uh, deliver more of the 20th century to you. I'll uh, try and uh, resuscitate those, uh, those slides from that drive or recreate them for the next time. Um, but uh, I'll thank you for coming. And if you have any questions, we have a mic runner at this time, and we can get you on mic. One right here. Someone over here, too? OK. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, as you, as these are recorded, um, do you make transcripts out of the files that you're recording so that... Yeah, um, the, these are all digital transfers from the original, uh, original discs. Um, although, I mean, 1955, although, you know, tape was in wide use by then, uh, you know, lacquer recordings were, were still quite widespread, especially in radio. So that's actually from a, a lacquer recording of 1955. Uh, oh, transcripts, you mean? Um, no, no, we haven't been, been doing that. Um, I, I suppose, you know, now with voice recognition and, and so on, you know, that becomes a, a possibility, but we haven't taken that step, no. Yeah. Okay. And there was someone over here. I don't remember, but. How many discs are in the NBC collection? <laughs> I believe it's a little over 170,000, uh, which you, those discs typically held 15 minutes to a side. Not all of them are double-sided, but it's probably on the order of at least 40 to 50,000 hours of broadcasting. Um, is, is the, or is it remain your goal to do preservation transfers of everyone. And I know that there are still some copyright issues that prevent some circulation, but we can physically go to the, go to the lab. Go across the street and listen to things there, yeah. Right, yeah. so the collection by now has been entirely data-based or, or available to see the list. It's almost all available um, in one form or another. The, as I say, it was acquired in the late 1970s, and at that time everything was tape-based. So, uh, you know, the bulk of the collection was copied to quarter-inch tape, and we've digitized those tapes, you know, and we don't think of those really as preservation. Yeah. Um, but it's been a tremendous boon to providing access in in the reading room, and um, yeah, so it's. You know, we, we are going back and digitizing, you know, some things, you know, it's an enormous, you know, copying it to tape was an enormous lift. Um, but, you know, we, we, we have revisited a number of things, especially things like NBC Symphony, you know, the, uh, the highest 
is you would want to get those you know, preserved at the highest possible level. But um, it's a it's a huge lift to go back and do preservation, uh, digitization of everything. That being said, you know the remarkable thing about these lacquers, even the ones from the mid '30s when they started. Um, is how well they've held up, with the exception of the glass lacquers that were made during the war, which of course many have broken, and they're also more prone to delaminating than the aluminum-based lacquers. Uh, it's amazing how well they have held up. Yeah. D has CBS donated any of their discs? Um, over the years, CBS made a number of donations. Uh, but nothing on the order of the NBC collection. We do have a lot of good CBS that was acquired over the years. That was more of an ongoing uh, program, you know, kind of a curated selection. So, you know, we weren't getting all the comedy, drama, soap operas like that. You know, it, a, lot, a lot of the best uh, CBS news programming uh, was acquired that way and the like, long-form documentaries that they were doing into the 60s and 70s, in fact, you know, we've acquired... Thank you very much. Sure. Um, um, over here, was there anyone? Okay, just a uh, gentleman again. Or was there someone over here? No? Okay. Um, so what happens to either the source material, um, so the original piece, or like you were saying, some of it was already recorded over to tape and now mm -hmm. it's being converted? We've kept the originals. And what, what do you do with the tape that was... Uh, we, we keep the tape, you know, belt, suspenders, you know, gaffer tape, whatever, you know. I mean, they're, because those are all first, they're, you know, first generation copies uh, from, from the lacquers. Uh, and, you know, in, in some cases, you know, there, there are lacquers, especially the ones on glass, which can't be played anymore. So, you know, the fact that we have a, a good tape copy uh, is very important. And where do you where are those kept? Uh, that's all down in Culpeper, Virginia, at the National Audiovisual Conservation Center. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Well, you can. Um, I think you can. Uh, yeah, the opti optical Irene. scan. I should have mentioned that. Yeah. I mean, e even some discs that are that are broken or you know in pieces, uh, you know, can can actually be played or rather. You know, the pieces can be played and it can be stitched back together digitally um, with the, uh, the Irene system, you know, which scans the groove, uh, essentially. Um, so, yeah, all is, all is not lost when that happens. Anyone else? Thank you.